this is a workshop. And the workshop is Dead Simple Testing with Mocha. Um, my name's Chris Hiller, and uh, here we are at OpenJS World 2020. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a developer advocate at IBM, uh, a Node.js core collaborator, uh, a Mocha maintainer, so um, maybe a subject matter expert, and um, an OpenJS Foundation Cross Project Council voting member. On GitHub, I am Bone Skull, and on Twitter, I'm Bone Skull with a zero instead of an O. And to the right is my avatar, which is like a smirking orange skull in a black circle. And so, uh, before before I, I talk about this workshop, um, I, I need y'all to uh, install some stuff. You probably have most of this installed, if not all of it, but to do this workshop, um, you're gonna need node version 12 or newer, uh, get version two point something. I don't think it matters too much. Uh, you're gonna want, um, actually you aren't gonna need a web browser, um, but uh, you will need a command line terminal app and you're gonna need a, a text editor or an IDE of your choice. So while I'm um, you know, talking here, um, please download those things, get them installed. So, um, all right. Um, this is the outline of this workshop. I'm going to start by talking about some of the conventions um, that we're gonna use here and, and how this is gonna go. Uh, next, I'll, I'll uh, get you set up with the uh, materials. Um, then I'm going to talk about testing, kind of just fun, uh, fundamentals of testing. Uh, I'll walk you through writing some tests, and then finally we'll take those tests and um, use them with Mocha. So, things about this workshop. So this is this is how. It, how, how it's going to go and um, what you can expect, who this workshop, uh, who this workshop's for. So um, you may be wondering if you should be here. So yeah, I, I would say probably, but um, I, I need to make some assumptions about where, where people are at and those assumptions are here. So you will need some JavaScript fundamentals. Uh, I'm not going to teach JavaScript. Um, you should be able to do some basic stuff on the command line. Uh, you should be able to navigate directories, you know, you know, move around through the file system. You should be able to uh, install packages through NPM. You should be able to run node uh, on the command line. You need some way of cloning a Git repository. You need to know how to clone a Git repository. But the one thing that you don't need to know is how to write a test or how to, um, excuse me, or how to use Mocha. And so there's much formatting and, and stuff um, in, in these slides. And um, I, I will post, post the slides after this workshop here. Um, un unfortunately, it looks like uh, you may need to, to uh, uh, type some things. So um, these are the conventions. So a keyword, um, it will be displayed in bold. Um, and that is just some terminology that'll do my best to define. Uh, inline code will be in a mono, uh, mono space font. Emphasis just means emphasis. It doesn't really mean too much other than what it means. Uh, file name is displayed in a mono space, but in black the name of a module, so a module on NPM, a, a built-in module is going to be in italics. Uh, a command that you are expected to run in a terminal or your uh, shell is uh, in green uh, in a monospace font. Uh, link is this kind of light blue and underlined. And uh, importantly, so this, this one in red, uh, it would be, be in red bold text, these are instructions for you. And so these instructions will say this is okay, this is what you need to do to move forward in the 
in the workshop. So there are going to be little exercises and <clears throat> everything that you need to do is in red. Uh, source code will be on the screen and it will be in like this blue box and it will be syntax highlighted. Terminal output will be in this kind of retro green with a black background. Um, it's just for showing you expected output. You're not expected to like copy it or anything. All right, so those are the conventions. Um, so I want to talk about what, what testing is. So testing, uh, software testing is a, a very broad field. There are many, 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 many ways to test software. Uh, there are many uh, you know, reasons to do one over the other uh, of types of testing. And so what does it do? It, so software testing tells us about the quality of software for some definition of quality. And so that's kind of, that's kind of up to you and your team and, and, and your project. Um, a test written um, by, tests are generally written by humans, but a test executed by a human is a manual test. So maybe that's sending things over to the QA team and they poke around your website and they try to break stuff. That's manual tests. Tests executed by a computer, these are automated tests. And so automated tests, they make assertions about software. Um, and, and, and assertion is, uh, I suppose the, the dictionary definition is, um, you know, you, you are checking something and you will, you will say yes or no if it, if it uh, passes that assertion. And the way this is done is writing more software. So you have your software and the automated tests are more software to test that software. So this talk or this workshop is about automated tests, not manual tests. So why would you even want to do this? So tests avoid bugs. Uh, we want to test our code to assert it does what we think it should do. We want to validate our assumptions. We um, want to, if you, if you know your intent, you want to make sure that the code reflects your intent. When software is well tested at the right level of abstraction, it helps you refactor your software because um, you'll know if you did something wrong and you'll know if you've broken an interface or a contract. When software is well tested, uh, you can be confident about making changes and releases and pushing that code live. Uh, when you have a, a green build, um, you feel better about it. When uh, you are uh, writing well tested software, you're going to have a, a, a better um, velocity in the long term as uh, it will reduce the time that you and your team spend fixing bugs and you will have time to do other stuff like make more cool things instead of fix the broken things. But it's not, you know, all, you know, it's not all roses, right? So there are reasons why you wouldn't want to write tests. So um, one thing can be, and if you've ever been in this position, you know, so a legacy piece of software, um, an old, older piece of software that maybe doesn't have tests, may be exceedingly difficult and time consuming to test and to write tests. Um, you know, manual tests are probably going to be much easier for that and it may be very difficult to um, get to the right level of abstraction uh, with, with testing a legacy code base because you know, there's such a thing as testable code and the legacy code base may not be testable. Uh, adding more tests does not mean that you are adding more value. It's not, it's not linear, uh, like a linear, it, it, it's, it, they're diminishing returns. So at some point, uh, you're going to get to a point where, you know, adding more tests doesn't really help. And instead it just introduces the, the third thing in this list, which is maintenance overhead. 
Um, it, automated tests are code, so they need to be maintained like code, right? So um, there may be a, a maintenance overhead, especially during refactoring. If your tests are not at that right level of abstraction, maybe they're too closely bound to the implementation. And I'm not going to get into, you know, the, the kind of nitty gritty there, but um, the testing, it, it, it also can de decrease short-term velocity. Anybody that tells you that, that you know, writing tests is free is, is lying to you and trying to sell something. It, it, there, is, there is an up, uh, upfront investment and it is a trade-off. Um, and uh, you know, it, it, it tends to work pretty well, but um, you know, there are certainly reasons that uh, you might wanna skimp on it, especially um, you know, if you're, if, you know, you have a, a, a startup that's struggling for cash or something like that. Um, maybe it's a good idea, maybe it isn't, maybe you like it, maybe you don't, but that's just kind of the way things are. So this is why you shouldn't write tests, but this workshop is not about not writing tests. This workshop is about writing tests. So we're going to go into the, 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 the setup here. Um, so there is a Git repository and I would like you to clone it. Um, and so this is the URL. Um, this is uh, wrapped a bit, but the um, URL is github.com forward slash bone skull forward slash dead dash simple dash testing dash with dash mocha. And this contains example code for the repo, um, don't mind the readme. The readme is a bit out of date, but these instructions are not. Um, and you can use a, uh, uh, any sort of client you want to clone. This is just the, the command line version if you wanna do that. So once you have that cloned, you're going to wanna navigate into the working copy which is the uh, dead simple testing with Mocha directory. You're gonna wanna run NPM install. And what this is going to do is it's going to um, reach into a bunch of, yes, it's a mono repo. <laughs> it's gonna reach into a bunch of subdirectories and, and run NPM install in there. It's, it's not really a huge deal, um, but uh, I'll wait uh, a few minutes and uh, let you do that. And I'm gonna kill my camera. I'm gonna give you about three minutes.
Okay, I think I'm gonna move on. Um, we kind of have a lot to cover. So uh, once you run npm install, of course, uh, you want to navigate into this 01 setup directory. Um, and uh, we're gonna take a look in there. And so in this directory, there is a directory called bargs, bargs. Um, maybe that stands for bone skull args, I don't know. So what the bargs package is, is it's a, it's a library and the library is a command line argument parser. And so uh, by command line arguments, we have uh, an example here. Uh, we have dash dash foo, dash dash bar equals bad. So these are command line arguments. You would give things like these to any sort of command line tool. And so the bargs package um, will accept something like this and return um, a nice object for you. And uh, you know, let's take a look at, uh, this is the project structure. There's, you should see a package JSON and SRC directory. Um, and I would like you to open the bargs forward slash SRC forward slash index.js file in your editor. And um, if you cannot, uh, I will show the code here next, uh, but it's probably gonna be easier for you to just take a look at it. Okay, so this is the source of bargs. Uh, bargs is a single function. Uh, that function is called parse. Um, parse accepts an array of arguments as the first option or the, or the first parameter and it accepts an optional second parameter which is an options object. And this is a pretty uh, common way of, of uh, a, a common function signature. Um, so it accepts an array again and an options object. Um, you will see uh, some uh, type defs here, if you're familiar with um, JS doc, doc strings, uh, these are actually like TypeScript style JS doc things. And so uh, you can look and see, you can get more information about um, uh, the, the options allowed here. And so uh, what this does, again, it accepts an array. It's going to um, essentially uh, walk through the array and start parsing arguments out of it. Um, an argument uh, is something that starts with a dash. Uh, it might start with two dashes. Um, it might start with three dashes, uh, but uh, that is considered a, a, like an option style argument. And then anything that does not uh, start with some dashes is considered a positional argument. And that winds up in a um, uh, property, uh, which is the underscore. And so this is uh, a convention that other uh, user land uh, libraries like Yargs use. Um, it's this underscore contains positional arguments. And so, um, you know, that's, that's kind of the size of it. Uh, there's you know, some special cases here, but uh, we'll, we'll go into this in, in more detail, you know, the intent, what exactly it's supposed to do. Um, but so this is, this is the example project we're going to test, um, but, but not right away. So we're gonna talk about, we're, we're gonna have you write a, write a test now, but first we need to uh, define some things maybe just one thing, but it's the word assertion. So an assertion, when I talk about an assertion in JavaScript, an assertion will check a condition. So maybe that's something like a, a uh, you know, if, right? And, and you give it your expression you wanna test. Um, just depending on the result of that conditional, the, the assertion can throw an exception. And so this is key. Um, the, the code here below, if some declared variable returning true, if it's true and returning false, if it's false, that's not an assertion. That's, I don't know what that is, but it's, it doesn't throw an exception and that's key. 
So um, we want to navigate into this zero, this, this other uh, uh, lesson directory. So, or, or exercise directory, whatever it's called. We want to go back up to the root of dead simple testing with Mocha. We want to go into the zero two, your first test directory. We want to go into the bargs directory in there. Then I want you to make a test directory. Uh, one may already exist. Um, so if it, uh, if it doesn't exist, go ahead and, and create that. That might want to be in make dir p Then I want you to create a new file in this test directory. Uh, call it uh, bards.spec.js. You can call it really whatever you want, but this is the file name I'm going to use here. Um, .spec.js is, is just a convention. You don't have to use it. A lot of people don't. Maybe you want to call it .test.js. It doesn't matter. I don't care. But uh, go ahead and create this file. It's going to be an empty file. Open it in your editor. Um, and this, the idea here is to get you comfortable with what a test is, and you will find that it is uh, not as complicated as, as uh, you may think. It's actually extremely simple. So I'll wait just a second for y'all to get that done. So say we have this empty file. I want you to put um, this in it. So if false, throw new error. That's it. So um, I guess I guess you can't very well copy and paste this, but go ahead and uh, um, type that out. I can again after this. I will uh, try to export this this uh, these slides in a, in a form in which you can copy and paste. But for now, please just type that. And what we have here is a test. So, um, you know, a test contains some sort of assertion. And, you know, it's a, it's, it's a static assertion. So false will always be false, but we have made an assertion here. Now, if false is true, what would happen? We would throw an error and, and, and the test would fail. But this is a test. This is, this is all it is. So, um, now we want to run this code. So I'm going to assume you've, you've typed something out like this and um, we're going to go ahead and run it. So you would run it this way. You're going to go into your terminal. You're going to run node and test forward slash uh, bargs.spec.js. If you are actually in the test directory, uh, just run bargs.spec.js. And so what happens when you run this? So I would really expect nothing to happen at all. I would expect the code to be executed. I would expect the process to just exit, exit and that's it. And that's, that's, that's what a passing test looks like. Uh, looks like. So your, your mission then is to make this test fail however you see fit. So you're going to go back into the bargs.spec.js file and you're going to change um, maybe the conditional in there and you're going to make it fail and you're going to go and you're going to run it again and uh, check your work. And um, I'm going to wait a couple minutes, but uh, if, if you've made it fail, uh, the result should look something like this. Okay, so here, here's, here's what I would do. I would change the false to true and that would, that would exit it or that, that would throw the exception and, and, and make, the, uh, make the test fail. Uh, and that's, that's really it, that, there's, there's your failing test. So we've got a, a passing test and a failing test and it, it's extremely basic. Um, and you could write tests this way if you wanted to, 
but it's not so much fun. So it works, but it's, it's too much boilerplate. There's, there's, you know, you're going to start finding that you're making the same checks over and over. You will, I don't know if there's a name for these, but I'm going to call them assertion patterns. And so you're going to find that you're making these checks again and again. So we're going to check, is this, is this value true? Is the value false? Does uh, value X equal value Y? Does the function Z throw uh, under a certain set of circumstances? And if it does, which exception? So these are, these are some examples of common assertions that you're going to see again and again. And so that's why we get things like the assert module. So the assert module is in Node. And you're probably going to want to go check out the docs right there. Um, that is uh, nodejs.org forward slash API forward slash assert.html. And this is the built-in assert module. And what it provides is assertion patterns as functions. And so we're going to use this instead of what we just did. So I want you to add uh, something like const assert equals require assert to the top of your bargs.spec.js file. Um, and so the exercise then, um, well, actually, so the, the, so let me talk a little bit more about the assert module. And so what that does is it provides all these assertion patterns, all the assertion patterns throw if, if for, you know, it, depending on the reason, but uh, depending on the function and why, uh, they will throw an, an assertion error, which is an exception. Uh, it's just a special subclass of error. It's an assertion error. It contains some extra metadata about the failed assertion. Um, yeah, it's, it's handy. So um, please note that we are not talking about, there's a module on NPM called assert, which may be roughly the same, but we're talking about the built-in assert module in Node. So you shouldn't have to go and NPM install an assert because it's already there. So um, I want you to replace your assertion on um, this, you know, if this, uh, where is it? This here, replace this with um, a call to a single function in the assert module. And so there's going to be probably more than one um, function you could use in there, but uh, yeah, give it a shot. See if you can replicate this except use uh, the assert module to do so. And I will wait a couple minutes. And um, I will give you a hint here uh, 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 very soon. Okay, so the hint is um, use the okay function. So it's assert.ok. Um, again, there are others you could use, but um, I'm gonna go with that one. And I'll give you another minute.
So if you've used <clears throat> if you've used assert.ok, it should look like this when you run it. So you will see something like expression evaluated to a falsy value, and it'll give you a little stack trace. Um, the assertion error object will have a code property, um, actual and expected. Uh, it will say, okay, so we expected true, but what we were passed is false. Um, operator must be the operator that it uses to, to make the comparison. So um, the thing about assert okay is it does not do like a strict check. It's a, it's a, it uses co uh, coercion, it, it uses the double dash. Uh, so if you say um, something like um, zero equals equals false, uh, that would be that would be the kind of truthiness we're talking about here. So the what I came up with was this. So um, we've, we've used the assert module here. And again, this is a not a, a strict uh, equality check. Um, and we've used the okay function and we've given it false and it should fail every single time you run it. So um, now we can uh, change this test, we'll fix it. And um, so it passes and uh, you know, this should be pretty trivial, um, but uh, w when it passes, what you should expect is that nothing happens. And that's, again, that's often what often what passing things will look like, but um, I'll wait just a minute. Okay, so uh, any one of these things would work uh, because of the it's uh, okay does it doesn't check the strict true value it's a truthiness check and so you could use any of these and this is trivial um, but it 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 il il illustrates the point so this file this barg js it's a test we're we're testing. I don't know the booleans, I suppose, but it's this. These are really all tests. Are they're just assertions? Um, anything else is um, kind of decorations around that. Um, and you'll you'll have noticed that we haven't touched bargs. Um, so we're going to look at at bargs here in the next section. Um, and uh, believe it or not, we're not even going to use Mocha yet. But um, so yeah. Here we are. Uh, this is what we've learned so far. We've learned about uh, assertions in JavaScript. We've learned how to run a very basic test file. And we've learned about the assert module built into Node. And now we're going to write some more real looking tests. And so bargs, let me talk a little bit more about bargs. So uh, this is like the, the, the motivation for bargs. So, the command line arguments in a node app are provided as an array, but parsing that array is tedious because you get all the dashes, you get all sorts of garbage and, and you need to go in there and so figure out which of those mean what and, and you know, maybe what you can ignore or not. And so a solution to this would be a library to accept command line arguments as an array um, and return an object which can be more easily understood. There are lots of packages out there that do this, lots of them. Um, Yargs, Commander, Minimist, um, and they do it much better than Bargs does, okay? So they're, they're good packages. Bargs is intended to just be like the minimum set of things that you would possibly want for, for, for this sort of functionality. And again, it has a single exported function, which is parse. So, um, and this, I'm going to show you a table next of uh, examples. So we're going to have, um, this is what we give bargs, the parse function, this is what we pass to it, and this is what we expect back. And so this will kind of cover the use cases that we're talking about. And, and command line argument parsing is, there's a lot going on there. 
but again, um, I'm trying to distill this down to the to the uh, the very minimum um, that we need. So um, here we have a table, and uh, the first uh, it, the first column here is the input array. So this is what we would pass the the, the parse function. And the second column, the output, is what we'd expect back. Um, and so we have these different situations that we need to handle. Um, you'll notice that there are notes on some of these um, because uh, it needs a little bit of a direction to do certain things. So um, you will uh, probably want to come, maybe I should just come back to it, but um, this is <clears throat> uh, this is something you're gonna wanna look at again. Um, I note that, the, that uh, the output object will always have an underscore property, and if there are no positional arguments, it'll be an empty array. So you don't, you don't need to worry too, too much about this right now, but this is just showing Okay, this is, this is the intent. This is what uh, we expect to happen. Um, we, you know, we, ex we expect um, a, a, an option that does not have any sort of parameter after it. That's supposed to be a Boolean. So there's a Boolean flag, yes, no. Um, we expect that stuff that only has one dash is, is also a Boolean if it does not have any sort of parameter. If we use an equal sign, that means we have some sort of parameter. Um, if we don't use an equal sign here on line one, two, three, four, five, six, we're going to need some, we're, you, you know, Bargs is going to need direction to figure out, okay, what is Baz here? Is Baz this, uh, the parameter to foo, or is that a, um, a, a positional argument? It, it needs, it needs a hint. If we, you know, do give it something that doesn't have any dashes, that's just a positional, and we can see that on the next line. Um, but so these are just, uh, again, examples. Uh, another special case is this bare double dash. And so if you've seen that before, maybe in command line, um, uh, uh, command line scripts, everything after that double dash is supposed to be a, a positional argument. It, it's supposed to be kind of read as is. And so that's how we're going to treat this. Um, uh, if we pass something with starting with dashes after that double dash, uh, that's still considered a positional. And so um, you know, it seems like a lot, but it's like, it really is kind of the bare minimum of what you need to do. Um, uh, another thing is that uh, by default, uh, Bargs works on process.argv.slice2. And so process.argv.slice2 is uh, essentially your, your command line options. The, the first and, and second element of that process.argv array, you don't usually need. It's like the node executable and the script name. Uh, you just care about the stuff after it. And so it uses that by default, but you can give it uh, a, an explicit array. So um, we want to pull bargs into our test file. And so um, I want to make sure, let's see here. Um, we should be actually in uh, the, uh, I, I believe, um, uh, whichever, uh, sorry, I didn't add this one, um, but it's whichever directory uh, it, where it says actual tests. And so in the um, dead simple testing with Mocha, there's gonna be you know, several uh, directories with numbers. You want the one that says, I think it says zero, 03 actual tests. You wanna go in there um, and uh, we want to, um, add this here to the top of bargs.spec.js. I've confused myself a little bit, but maybe we don't actually need to do that yet. So, um, I think we want to, let's just skip this one for now. I wanna make sure where, uh, where we are in the file system. I'm going to talk about unit tests. 
um, which is some, some uh, terminology that we need to understand. So what we're going to do with BARGS is we're going to write a unit test for it. And uh, a unit test is a test that makes, again, an assertion like any other test, and it's going to make an assertion about a unit. But now we have to define unit. What's a unit? A unit is the smallest testable bit of code, right? So what is generally the smallest testable bit of code? Generally, that is a function. And for our purposes, it's a function. So a unit test is a test that makes an assert assertion about a unit. A unit is, in our case, a function. Um, so uh, what we want to do with a unit test um, is we want to try to test that function independently of other functions. Um, that, that's kind of a, 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 a broad topic as well, you know, how to achieve this independence uh, or uh, isolation when testing uh, a function, but I'm not going to go into it here. So we have a single function parse, and that's what we're going to test. But where do we start testing? Um, let's look at BARGS, the source of BARGS, and, and see if we can find a, a good place to start. And a lot of this has to do with kind of personal, you know, what you, what you prefer to do. I like to start testing exceptions. So um, here, um, there's going to be this line highlighted in orange. Okay, and so this expects value property, um, this is how we tell BARGS that a, an option, say dash dash foo, expects some sort of parameter after it. So um, maybe we want to say dash dash require, uh, you know, hypothetically, uh, dash dash require um, baz, right? So we have a command and we want to we wanna pass require baz to it. Um, and we don't want to have that equal sign in there. And the only way to do that is to give BARGS a hint that hey, we, we are expecting um, a value for this require option. And so in that ops, uh, we would have this expect value array and in that array, we would have require. And that tells BARGS, hey, require expects something after it. And so, um, you know, this, this is JavaScript uh, and uh, it's kind of loosey goosey. So um, we're doing a, a basic check uh, to see if uh, argv is an array. Um, if it is not an array, we uh, assume that we've passed it an options object, and we assume that we just want to um, use the default here. Actually, I think that might not even be necessary. Um, I think that's redundant, but uh, so yeah, we want to, actually, no, it's not, it's fine. So uh, we want to uh, allow, a user to pass just an op options object and we'll use the default process rv slice too. Then we go and we want to get a unique set of everything in this opt expects value because we don't really need to, to duplicate things, right? So um, we want to, and one way to do that anyway is to create a new set. Um, and so on this line, um, we're making a new set from ops expects value. But this function is written so that if you do not pass ops, you uh, will uh, get a uh, expects value of an empty array. But if you do pass it and you give it an expects value and you give it something truthy that isn't an array, parse will throw an exception because you cannot, or something that's not iteratable anyway, you cannot just, um, instantiate a new set with like a number or something. It has to be something that is, is uh, uh, iterable. So what we're gonna do is make a, um, a uh, expects, uh, let's see, we're gonna make an assertion that checks our um, parse function for this behavior. And so let's go in here. Um, so we want to check an exception, but before we do that, why do we want to do that? Because Bargs is a library. You're going to have people using the library, maybe. Um, and parse is a public API. It's the interface of the function. 
And so when people use your library, they expect it to work. Um, and uh, they expect it to fail in the same way. So you might not think about it, but it's like, yeah, that's, that's another one of the, the, it might not be in the explicit API, but people will expect your code to fail how it has always failed. And if we um, don't check our failure states, we could break that and break users and, and, and cause problems with consumers. So um, let's see here. We want to, ah, uh, I'd like to check uh, if uh, we are where we, where I think we are here. So let me pop out of here really quick and um, I am just looking to All right. Um, yeah, so I had left, I had left out directions here, but um, what we want to do is, uh, come on, we want to go into the 0.3 uh, actual test directory, and that directory is, again, a bargs directory. There is a test directory, and there is a bargs.spec.js file in there already, and that file contains uh, it contains this, okay? And so we want to change this. And the first thing we want to do to it is we want to require this parse function. So um, at the top of this file, which is in the 03 actual tests, forward slash bars, forward slash test, we want to add something like const uh, this parses require. And so it'll, it'll go and it'll grab the function out of bargs. There are other ways to do this, but the, that's how we're doing it here. Um, so uh, what we want to do is we have all these assertions. You can delete them all. Um, and so you're going to have your test file. It will have a require assert and it will have a require of bargs. And so what we want to do is replace all this, all this stuff with a call to assert.throws. And again, you're going to want to look at these docs. And uh, again, it's the assert module, nodejs.org forward slash API assert.html. You're going to want to look at assert.throws. And that is a function in there that's uh, API in the assert module and what that function is going to do. It accepts a function. It accepts a function. It does not accept a return value. It accepts a function to be clear about that. Um, and so we're going to pass it a function and we want to pass it um, a function which calls parse. And we want to call parse with an ops parameter of expects value. And we want to give it a like a empty object for the value of expects value. Okay. And so what we want to do is we want to make sure what we're trying to do, we want to make sure when we pass expects value with an empty object, we want to make sure our test, our, our, our test, uh, our, excuse me, our parse function throws an exception. So the test should pass, but bargs should throw an exception. And so I will wait a minute while you check this out.
Okay, so um, again, if you've done this correctly, what should happen when you run it is nothing should happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is your, that's your passing test. If you did something wrong, you're probably gonna get an exception. But this is what I came up with. So um, your bargs.spec.js should look like this now. Um, so we're calling the uh, throws uh, function in the assert module, and we're giving it a, um, a lambda arrow function. And um, we want to pass uh, a call. We want in this uh, arrow function, we want to call parse, and we want to give it options and expects value of an empty object. And so this is the thing, this is the subject of our assertion. This is what we're testing, this, this, this little arrow function. And so uh, when we do that, we uh, also give the assert uh, throws that function some, some information about the uh, assertion that we expect back. And so what I would expect out of this is a type error. And that will throw out of the call to new set again. So we're, we're calling new set and we're giving it something that's not iteratable. We're going to get something like object is not iterable. That'll be the message and um, that error will be a type error. Um, so what would happen if we uh, modified this? And I would uh, actually, I would uh, suggest you copy what I have here, but um, uh, what happens if we modify the name uh, to read error instead of type error? What would happen, you think? It would fail. Uh, it matches the name um, exactly. We are using a regular expression here to test the message. And the message um, is going to be longer than object is not iterable. I don't know exactly what it says. Um, but some portion of that message, this, this regular expression says some portion of the, the message should look like this. Um, but it doesn't need to match the message exactly. And so that's kind of handy. Um, uh, especially, yeah, messages and exceptions can change. Um, it would be cool to, uh, uh, sorry, all the, uh, a bunch of errors thrown out of node now have this code property, um, which is a better thing to check. Um, here, we don't have that. Uh, it's just a, a uh, error out of V8. It's, it's a language error or a API error. So, um, yeah, that is our first exception assertion. We want to add another assertion now. And so uh, I think what you probably do is, so assuming your barred spec JS looks like this, copy the assertion and paste it again, and then change the value to one instead of a empty object. And we're going to use just, we're going to write just another assertion to do this. And um, when you run it, it should fail, uh, and I'm going to need you to go in and change uh, the the options to assert.throws so that the test passes. So I'm going to wait just a minute. Okay, so you have gone into here, you've changed expect value to be one, and then you've, um, 
updated it. So uh, it would look very similar to the last one that we wrote, um, except the message will say number one is not iterable. It's not going to say object is not iterable. Number one is not iterable. And so, um, yeah, so these are how to test exceptions coming out of our, our, our function. And, and, and a cool thing about writing tests this way is it makes you think a bit more about, about the API, the function API that you're writing. So while I was doing this, I was thinking, well, you know what? That's not really helpful to um, somebody trying to use my code. You know, maybe instead of letting JavaScript throw that error, I should check and make sure that um, uh, expects value is iterable. And if it isn't, then I'm going to throw a custom error that says something like expects value should be, you know, an array. Um, and that would just be kind of more, I, I think, consumer friendly. Um, but just something to note that, uh, you know, writing tests like this can help you really kind of dog food, kind of feel how, how it feels to use an API that you're writing. Um, and so we've done our uh, exceptions and I wanna move on to actually checking the, what happens when parse does not throw, right? So this is the, the usual usage of, of parse. Um, we're gonna give parse valid input. So an array of uh, command line options, and then we're gonna check the return value. And if you go into, you probably still have the, the documents open if you've looked at them at all, but if you have the documentation open for the assert module, you can poke around in there. And you'll see that there's a does not throw function. You don't want that for this. So it's, it's, um, it's for like void functions, right? So if you have a function that has side effects, for example, maybe you just want to check that it, that it doesn't throw because it's not going to ever re return anything, right? Um, but in our case, our function returns something, it should return the same, you know, it should, it, yeah, we want to just test the return value because we can. Um, so what we want to do is add a third assertion. So your bargs.spec.js should have these first two assertions about the uh, exceptions. It should have a third assertion, uh, assertion now. And we want to pass um, this uh, array right here. Uh, it's just a array with one element and that element is dash dash foo and, and it's a string. And we want to pass that to parse and we don't want to pass options. And so we want to make a call to uh, assert dot deep strict equal. That's what we want to use here. And we want to um, assert that the return value of calling parse with this array is an object we expect. And so here it says refer to table of expected behavior. I'm going to wait just a second and um, uh, make sure we have the, have the instructions here. So, we're going to add an assertion that asserts, uh, asserts that passing valid arguments to parse returns an object of a, of a certain shape. And we're going to use assert.deepstrict equal to do that. And here's my refer to table of expected behavior. Does this work? Yes. Okay, so uh, there it is. Um, the input array again is uh, actually this is kind of a Yeah, that's that's misdirection a bit. So, um, I, what I would do is this instead. I would go and we would we would check uh, we would pass this parse to uh, assert that deep strict equal, and we want to expect um, just give it like an empty object, right? So that would be the second parameter. And so you're going to run that code, and it's going to fail, and you're going to it's going to tell you why. It's going to say, oh, well, it doesn't match. This empty object is not what parse returned. It returned something else entirely. And um, so you're going to want to look at that and see what it, what it returned and um, update your assert, accord, uh, assert call accordingly. And so I'll give you a minute to look into that. But uh, another thing is do not use uh, deep equal or equal. Those, those functions are both deprecated. 
uh, you want deep strict equal or, or strict equal. And here, especially you want deep strict equal. This is deep strict equal is for uh, comparing objects. Uh, strict equal is for comparing primitives. So that's why you want to use this function. So I'm going to wait a minute and we're going to check that return value. Okay, so this is what I came up with for, for this one. So um, we're going to call assert deep strict equal, and we're going to pass it. Um, we're passing it the return value of parse. We're not passing it a function. Um, we're passing. Uh, we're we're actually making a call to parse, and we're giving it the arrays array we expected, and uh, we're going to get back. Um, underscore empty array, which again is these positional arguments. And we're going to get foo, uh, foo is true. Foo prop, prop, uh, mm. The foo pro, uh, property is true. Um, so if we had used strict equal here, this would not work um, because uh, strict uh, equal um, will expect the objects to be the very same objects. Uh, and so that's not going to work because parse returns a completely new object every time. Um, deep strict equal instead uh, checks primitives. And uh, there's actually, it does a whole lot of things. And you can read the docs and see exactly what it, what it means. Um, but in, in our case, this is, this is probably the correct thing to test. So, uh, Great. We've written some tests in a file. It's just a bunch of assertions. And so um, there's, this is, you know, this is not good. There, there are problems with, with doing it this way. Um, they're not, you, you know, you can overcome them. You know, Node, uh, Node.js itself um, tests uh, itself essentially in this manner. But um, what happens if you run this file and it's got this three assertions in it and the, and the second assertion fails? An exception is thrown and your process exit exits and we never reach the third assertion. Um, okay, so if we wanna make sure that all of our stuff gets executed, we would maybe wrap things in try catch. Um, but that's, adding boilerplate, right? Um, so yeah, you're gonna maybe write a function to do that for you. 
then you've started writing a test framework. But uh, there are kind of limited options for organization here. Um, maybe you can come up with your own uh, set of functions to help organize things. Otherwise, you're you're kind of stuck adding, you know, using like a bunch of different files. You can't put a whole bunch of stuff in one file. Um, you know, that it's just gonna be like a huge God test and it's gonna be awful. So there's limited options for organ organizing your code unless you essentially, again, write some sort of framework. You can only run a single file at once. Maybe you uh, have written a script to include all of your other test files, um, but that seems like a pain in the butt. Um, or, you know, it, it's gonna need a custom script if you wanna run more than one file at once because you can't just give a whole bunch of files to Node, you give Node one script and that's what it runs. Um, and so uh, limited reporting options, right? So uh, we're throwing um, if something fails, but what happens on success? Again, you're, you're not seeing anything. If all our assertions pass, the, the process will just exit with exit code zero and it won't print anything. And so if you want more information than that, you're gonna have to code it up yourself. And again, that's like going down the path of I'm gonna write a test framework. And so this is where test frameworks that have already been written can help you. And this is where Mocha can help you. So um, let's talk about the, what we've done in this actual testing section. So we've talked about BARGS, which is a library for parsing command line arguments. Uh, we've learned what a unit test is, and we've learned what a unit is, which is generally a function. We've learned how to test a module. So we have a test file, we've pulled in our module bargs and we've run some tests against it. We've learned how to use the assert module uh, built into Node to test exceptions, uh, the behavior of our uh, parse function and um, how it throws some exceptions. We've learned how to assert uh, the return values uh, for a given input from, from parse. And we've learned how this can kind of snowball a bit. And, um, and this is how something like Mocha could help. So now we're gonna talk about actually Mocha. So here's Mocha. Mocha is a testing framework for JavaScript. <clears throat> uh, it it's a framework, right? So if you think of a framework, maybe you think of, uh, I don't know, React, Angular, uh, Express, stuff like that. Um, and like other frameworks, Mocha, uh, the, the, the aim here is to allow you, the developer, to focus on your specific applica uh, application specific details um, instead of <clears throat> calling into the library and, and, and making functions that way. It, 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 like other frameworks, you kind of fill in the blanks with um, your, your application specific code, like you would write a React component. Uh, React uh, provides this um, you know, <laughs> it's a framework for, uh, for components and maybe you write, write a component, you kind of fill in the blank with, with what's unique to your code. And Mocha works the same way. It says, okay, you fill in the blanks with your tests and assertions and I'm gonna give you some, uh, some functions to help you do that. So, and Mocha, again, Mocha's purpose, much like the purpose of any framework is to make, make, make it easier um, to do what you're trying to do and, and focus on the, the specific concerns that you have instead of needing to worry about these things that you always need to do. Like you always need to, um, you know, maybe report on, on failures. You always, always need to report successes. Maybe you don't always need to, but um, you always need to, uh, you know, have some, some, some way to organize things. Uh, you know, you always need to be able to run multiple files at once. So, you know, Mocha, a framework, a test framework, um, its pur purpose is to, to make this easier. Um, so now we're gonna go into this uh, 04 introducing Mocha directory. And so that's right off the working cup, uh, the main root in the dead simple testing with Mocha. Um, want to go into the 04 um, directory and in there there's another bards and in this one and I hope I haven't done this already but um, we want to install Mocha in here 
Okay, so you're going to go into this directory and you're going to install Mocha as a dev dependency. Um, typically, if you're going to use Mocha uh, on an actual project, you're going to want to install it as a dev dependency. The only way, uh, time you would not want to do that is generally if you're trying to build a plugin or something. Um, and even then, yeah, if you're trying to build on top of Mocha, you might not want to use a dev dependency, but generally just do that. So I'll wait a sec while you go into uh, 04 introducing Mocha and uh, install npm install in bargs. And again, there should be a package JSON in there and it should update um, your package JSON when you do that. It might even make a lock file. I don't know. But um, yeah, please install Mocha and I'll give this a minute. All right, it shouldn't take that long. Uh, I mean, it's not that bad. So um, let's assume we have Mocha installed in this. 04 introducing Mocha, Bargs. So yeah, we got it in there. And uh, now we can open up our package.json. And um, in that package.json, there should be, there should not be a scripts uh, property, but we wanna add one. So. Uh, we want to add a script called test and um, what the value of that script should be is mocha test forward slash barks dot spec dot js. And so what this is going to do is this is uh, going to allow us to run our tests uh, with npm just by uh, typing npm test on the command line. And so once you've added this to package.json, um, and you may need a comma, don't forget your comma somewhere, but uh, once you've added it, um, exit and uh, run npm test. And what you should see is something like zero passing, um, if you've done this correctly. And the reason you will see zero passing is um, so, oh, yeah, that test bargs.spec, that has been, that should be updated to include all the assertions we wrote in the last section. Um, so, um, yeah, so that does have the assertions in it, but when you run npm test, you should see zero passing. And that is because while the code in bargs.spec.js is being run, it is not running in a way that Mocha knows about. And so it's a framework and there are conventions and API calls and things. And uh, we're not using any of those yet. So you should see zero passing when you run NPM test. So I assume this works. Again, what we want to do is add a test script to our package JSON and we want to run Mocha on our test file. So let's talk about tests in Mocha. What is a test in, a Mo in Mocha? Um, so a test has a title and it has a body. And a body is just a function and that function contains uh, an assertion. Maybe it contains one or more assertions. Um, and the title describes the behavior. So um, Mocha's default API, it, it sort of mimics nat natural language. And it, you, if you're coming from, I don't know, Java or something, and you see this, this API, you're going to be like, what? So it's, it's the name of the function to create a test. Um, by default, Mocha is it, I-T, it. And uh, that's a global API. So when you write a test in Mocha, you don't need to require Mocha or import Mocha. Uh, you can if you really, really, really want to, but it's not necessary because it dumps this into the global context. And so um, it's called it. It makes a test. Um, 
the reason behind this is, so uh, Mocha is actually pretty old. I think it's about eight or nine years old now. And it was inspired by a testing package for Ruby. And that testing package is RSpec. And so RSpec's API looks a lot like Mocha's API. Um, and so for whatever reason, and I don't really know, I don't really understand the spread of things, but um, now, you know, in uh, Mocha, we have this kind of natural language API. Uh, Jasmine, which is maybe just as old as Mocha, also uses the same type of API. You're going to see uh, it. Um, and Jest is another one that, that can also use this API. Um, it's kind of, you know, again, it's mimicking natural language. And that API, uh, this natural language thing, it, it's based on something called BDD or behavior driven, is it behavior driven design or behavior driven development? If you're really interested, you can look it up, but it doesn't really matter um, because we're just talking about the API. And it, it does, yeah, it's, it's, I'm not going to go into BDD, um, but you don't really need to know anything about BDD to use Mocha or, or any of these testing tools. You just need to understand, oh, okay, this is what the API looks like and, and that's what it means. So that's what a test is in Mocha. Uh, what we want to do is we want to open our bargs.spec.js, which again should have all these assert assertions already in it. It should have three assertions. And we want to um, mocha-fy this test file. And so how we're going to do that is, um, uh oh, monitor? I'm not sure if we just lost that monitor. Um, it's got a flaky power cord. Uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe we're still, it's still up. Um, if it's still, if it's not up, please somebody tell me. Anyway, so um, let's see here. Uh, okay, great. Uh, so, right, we wanna wrap uh, the call to assert module in a test. And so it's gonna look like this. So that very first uh, uh, assertion we made about the type error where we pass it a um, bare object. We're gonna, we're gonna do something like this. And I want you to type this out. So it should throw a type error. And uh, this is the title, should throw a type error. And the body is this function. And so in that function, we need to put an assertion. Okay, so you don't need to, remember, you don't need to require Mocha or anything. You just, you just write it. It's there when you run this with Mocha. Okay, so um, for each of these three calls to assert, uh, we're gonna wrap it in, in, a, in a Mocha test. And we're gonna give each a title. And uh, again, the title describes the behavior we're, we're testing, okay? So the first two would say something like throw a type error and the last one should be like it returns some sort of object. Um, but yeah, we wanna wrap those assertions in a call to it and we want to put that assertion in the second parameter which is the, 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 the test uh, body. And I'll wait just a second for you to, to wrap this up.
<clears throat> okay, so if you did this right, um, what you're going to see when you run NPM tests is something like this. Um, maybe it'll have even nicer colors. But what this is, it's the output of Mocha's default reporter. Um, and so you should see three lines, each uh, corresponding to one of the tests. Uh, remember the, the it, uh, each corresponding to one of the tests that you've written. If you didn't get this working, maybe you'll see something like this. And I apologize for the um, two columns here, but uh, so maybe the third one didn't work for whatever reason. Um, you're going to see something like this. So we'll see the should throw a type error. Those two have passed. And uh, we'll see this, the, the third test is failing. And this is what the output from Mocha looks like if your tests are failing. So the way I got this failure was I changed the assertion to um, foo false instead of foo true. So um, yeah, but anyway, we don't we don't want to we don't want to do that. We want our tests to pass. So this is what this is what I came up with for this, um, and that's how I got the success. This is how I got this here. It's um, so we have three tests. It should throw a type error, and then there's this function, which is the body. And in that body is just the assertion we wrote before. OK. And um, the second one is similar. Uh, again, the, the title of a test should describe the behavior uh, of the code under test. So uh, the third one um, should return an object having property foo true. Yes, it does, but it also has this other property and we'll get to that later, but it's good enough for now. So now we have three tests and um, we run NPM test. NPM test uh, runs Mocha, which loads this test file and we're using Mocha's API to create tests. So we've created three tests here. Yay. Now I wanna introduce suites. So what a suite uh, in Mocha, um, does it, it describes a scenario, a situation, a use case, some sort of context. Um, there are lots of words you could describe it. It's also just kind of a logical grouping or collection of tests. You could think of it that way. Um, uh, but each suite, much like a test, has a title string, and this is required, and it has a body function, which is also required. Uh, the body of a suite can contain one or more tests. Uh, it can contain other things too, but we're not going to get into that today. Um, the title describes the suite, describes the scenario. And um, uh, that API is called describe. So we want to create a suite and um, uh, give it a title and a body. Uh, and presently in Mocha, uh, body is always synchronous. So I, I failed to mention before, but it was in the slide that a test in Mocha can be asynchronous. It can return a promise. Uh, if you want to use node style error first callbacks, I'm sorry, you can do that too. Um, but uh, a suite, uh, user with describe uh, for now, in, in, is always synchronous. That might change in the future, but um, you can't return a promise from, from a, a uh, uh, a described body. So what we want to do is organize our tests using these suites. And we want to wrap um, the tests in suites describing the scenario. So uh, for example, the first one might look like this. Um, our, our scenario is when opts.expects value is an object, it should throw a type error. And the assertion is the same assertion we used before. Um, and again, the body um, contains a test. Uh, just we can just use the test we used before. So go ahead and edit um, bargs.spec.js, and um, you should have three suites when you're done. And uh, run npm test to check your work. And I'll leave this up for a second so you can so you can kind of copy it to get started.
Okay, I expect you have that copied. Um, if you did it right, uh, it should look like this when you run an NPM test. Maybe not exactly like this, but similar to this. Um, the when blah, blah, blah is the title of the suite and under that will be any uh, tests in that suite and it should be indented a bit. And I'll wait just a minute. All right, um, so this is how we would make something like that happen. So this is, this is adding suites to our, our tests, uh, our tests. So in here, you're gonna have, um, it's pretty simple. You have describe and that describe body is, um, is your test that you had before. And you have three of these things, right? So you may have noticed that when we did the tests the first time, or is that? So should throw a type error, should, and that doesn't have, that's not very helpful. Um, what should throw a type error? What should return an object having property foo? And this is what suites help you with, because now we know what exactly we're talking about when, when we, when we uh, execute those tests. All right, so that's a, that gives us some more context that describes the situation or the scenario. And that's why we want to use suites. So the next core concept, and, and there are only really three, three of these things you need to worry about. There are three core concepts here in Mocha. There's the test, the suite, and finally the hook. So hook may be a term that is used to mean a lot of different things, but in Mocha, uh, a hook is a code that runs before all the tests, after all the tests, before every test or after every test. And uh, a hook runs in the context of a suite. So um, just like, uh, you can think of a hook, um, it's essentially just like a test. Uh, you don't actually need to make the assertion in it, but the API is the same. So um, the title uh, is optional though. You don't need to give, uh, give uh, these hook functions a, a title, um, but they can be asynchronous. They can return promises. Um, and so uh, you can think of these like uh, set up or tear down functions. Uh, maybe uh, uh, some other test framework uh, or, or in another language, maybe has a notion of uh, what's, this is how we set up our tests. This is the test harness or what have you. And then we have uh, a teardown to clean up afterwards. Um, and so in this API, which again, it's a global API, uh, you don't need to require or import anything. Uh, we have four functions before, before each, after and after each. So uh, the idea is that um, before uh, will run once, um, basically before any of the tests uh, and before each will run once for every test. And so the order in which things happen is, uh, is this. And maybe I should have added a diagram or something, but um, when you have uh, suites in Mocha like so, uh, the very first thing that happens when Mocha runs this file is it goes and it finds all the suites. And that's like a, a depth first search. So it looks for uh, a describe and in there it, it says, oh, okay, I have a call to it, I have a, a call to hook. Um, you can nest uh, suites, so maybe there's more describes. So it looks through all the describes. Now it doesn't run any tests yet. It doesn't run any hooks yet. It's just like mapping it out and, and getting an understanding of where everything goes. And so um, uh, that happens first. And then within a suite, um, before will run. So this is the before all hook. Um, 
after that, so uh, before each will run, if these things exist. Then finally, a test will run, then after each will run, okay? And then after all the tests are done in the suite, the after hook runs, okay? Um, most of the time, you're probably going to be using before each, uh, at least in my experience, um, before is useful maybe for uh, if you've got something really slow that you won't, don't want to do before every test, maybe, I don't know, start a server, I don't know. Um, but uh, before isn't used uh, uh, quite as often, but before each is used often. So what we want to do is um, we want to use um, 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 hooks to, to make our tests a little more efficient. So um, that third one, so the third suite, when passed a single argument foo, as I mentioned before, it's not, um, yes, we're, we're checking the value equals a thing, but we only check a single, we, uh, when we described it, we only had a single property. So what I wanna do is split that up. I wanna split this, um, uh, the test in the suite into two tests. So our third, uh, third suite, when pass a single argument foo, it should have two functions in it, or two tests. And um, we're going to test two separate properties of, of the return value here. So in both tests, we're calling parse, and we're giving it uh, dash dash foo in an array. In the first test, we're making sure that the return value has a property foo and that foo is equal to true. And then the second test, we're making sure that it has an, a property of underscore and that's an empty array. So you wanna essentially copy this down um, and then we'll, we'll use this and I'll show you how to use hooks. So I'm gonna wait a couple minutes for you to um, copy this down. Okay, we're a little crunch for time here. So we want to use a hook in this exercise. So I assume we've copied that down. So um, we want to add a before each hook to the when pass the single argument foo suite. And it prepares, it prepares the scenario. It sets it up for the two tests in that suite. And uh, below you will see a link to the Mocha docs on hooks and it talks about how to, how to use them. But you want a before each hook and your test body. So um, that would be uh, the stuff in, so the stuff in um, it. So uh, right here where we have assert strict equal, um, the only function call in that test body should be the call to, the, to, to assert. We shouldn't need to call parse in the test body. And uh, the way I prefer to do this is to declare a variable in the suite body. And then in the hook, define that variable. And there are other ways to do this. You may uh, prefer one or the other, but I prefer to use function scope and do it this way. So um, I'll leave this here and um, yeah, please create a, uh, a before each hook that we'll call parse. And um, in those two functions, we're going to check that, that return value. And I'll forward that in a second and uh, you can see what the expected output will be.
Okay, so if you did this, um, you should see the same output you did before. So um, it, we're essentially refactoring into hooks. Um, but the test uh, and suite output should be the same as we had before. Maybe not as we had before, because we split that function into two. Um, so yeah, that third suite's gonna have gonna have two tests in it. Okay, so we need to kind of wrap this up. So this is what I would come up with to, to, to refactor um, the suite to use hooks. So um, in, the, in, the, in the suite body, I want to declare a variable. I call it result. You can call it whatever you want, uh, but I don't define it. And so uh, in before each, I will define the variable and the variable is the return value of passing um, you know, dash dash foo to parse. And so we can use function scope here. And um, because before each runs before those two tests, uh, result will be defined by the time we enter them. And so uh, below we can just check the result. Uh, it, we can look at result.foo, is this true? And then finally, we can look at uh, the positional arguments again, which is underscore, and we can assert that it is an empty array. Now, remember, remember what I said about deep strict equal and strict equal. So strict equal works on uh, primitives and deep strict equal works on objects. And an array, an array is an array, but an array is also an object. And so you have to use deep strict equal if you wanna compare arrays. Another way to do that maybe is we can look at the length of the underscore array and uh, we could use strict equal there. We could say assert strict equal, uh, give it result dot underscore dot length and then the expected value will be zero. So that is how to use a hook in Mocha. And um, you know, before each, again, we'll run before every test, after each will run after every test. There's before and, and after, and you can, again, check out the docs at mochajs.org uh, to get more information about, uh, about how to use them. And so in this section, I have covered how to install Mocha how to run tests with Mocha, um, how to configure your package JSON uh, to run Mocha when we call NPM test. And finally, how to create tests, suites, and hooks in Mocha and uh, the definitions thereof. And um, I think that about does it. So uh, again, uh, my name is Chris Hiller. I'm a developer advocate at IBM, a Node.js core collaborator, a Mocha maintainer, OpenJS Foundation CPC. Find me on GitHub Bone Skull, Twitter Bone Skull with a zero. Um, I also have another talk. I think it might actually be right after this one about uh, tooling in Node.js. It's called Possible Tools. You might want to check that out. Also, I'm a panelist on uh, JS Party, which is a fun JavaScript centric podcast. And they are having some sort of live podcast uh, here at OpenJS World. Check out the schedule for that. I couldn't tell you when it is because I don't know where you live. So yeah, time zones are hard. Um, but uh, thank you for 
for attending, attending this workshop and I will be around for a few minutes to